Welcome to Fringe Pop 321, the show that believes the world is stranger than we think, but thinking should not be strange. Everybody who's into the fringe has heard of Bigfoot, also known as Sasquatch or Yeti. Earlier, we did an episode on Fringe Pop about alleged Bigfoot DNA. It turns out that there wasn't really too much to that. On this episode, though, we're going to revisit Bigfoot, this time by way of Zana. Who is Zana, you might ask? Well, if you don't know, you're not alone. While a lot of people have heard about Bigfoot, only the really dedicated Bigfoot fans have heard of Zana and know what we're going to be talking about. The story of Zana is odd to say the least. In succinct terms, Zana was allegedly a feral woman captured in the mid-19th century in Russia, specifically Abkhazia, a region in northwest Georgia. According to the story, Zana had a number of physical and behavioral attributes that suggested that she was a hybrid child of a human woman by a Sasquatch, or Bigfoot or Yeti, whichever one you prefer, or the Almasti, that is the term of choice in Abkhazia for Bigfoot. And yes, you heard all that correctly, a human Bigfoot hybrid. That's what the Zana story is about. Is there anything to it though? Has there really been evidence of a Bigfoot human hybrid out there since the 19th century? I mean, how could we not have heard this? Well, that's the subject of this episode on Fringe Pop 321. The most detailed online retelling of the Zana story is probably that of Ray Crow. We've linked to that story on this episode's webpage on the Fringe Pop 321 website, but I'd like to quote a few segments of it here. According to his 2010 essay, The Zana Affair, Zana supposedly had the following attributes. She was unusually tall, so the story goes, six feet, six inches. She had a massive build with large breasts. She had dark black skin with dark and reddish hair covering her body. She had red eyes, strong, sharp teeth, refused to wear clothing, and had an amazing tolerance to cold weather. She was also unable to speak or learn how to speak. Now, I hope you remember all that as we proceed, because when it comes to the fact that Zana bore children to a variety of men, you're going to wonder what the attraction was for sure. It doesn't sound like any woman that ought to be drawing that sort of interest, if you know what I mean. So, were they really that desperate? I mean, is there really something to the story? It just sounds, from the get-go, a bit contrived. Now, there are no known pictures of Zana, though, and so a lot of that description may just be completely fabricated, and as you'll find out, probably is. Drawings show some of these features in what appears to be an ape-like and not completely human form. There are photos of her children, though, and they look, surprise, surprise, human, with Negroid and Caucasian mixed figures, and that's going to become important as we proceed as well. Zana was bought and sold a few times before winding up in the household of a local resident, Kamshish Sabakia. Now, since all four of her children adopted the family name of Sabakia, it seems likely, at least there's a good chance, that he was actually their father and they weren't fathered by disparate men. The parentage of her children is not completely clear though, we have to admit that, though since part of the Zana legend involves allowing local men to have her sexually as the prize of drinking games and other contests, Again, you might wonder what the attraction is, but this is just the detail of the story. It's noteworthy that all her children had dark skin, and the oldest lived to 1954. Zana herself died in 1890. As one might suspect, there's more than meets the eye to the Zana story. A Jason Colavito notes on his blog, which is devoted to evaluating fringe claims, that according to Pseudoscience, a critical encyclopedia, a Russian scholar named Alexander Mashkovtsev first heard about the Zana story in the 1970s. He then passed it on to Boris Proshnev, a historian who developed the hypothesis that Neanderthals remained active in Asia down to modern times and are behind Yeti and wild man legends. 
Now, Colavito juxtaposes this cycling of the story with the fact that there are no primary source documents of any kind that support the Zana story. Colavito and others find the Negroid features of Zana's children highly suspicious and informative. Recall that there are no known photos of Zana. We are entirely dependent on the legend for her presumed appearance. Now her children though, as we've said, for whom there are photographs, look like one would expect of black Africans or Africans who had intermarried with people from the Caucasus region. Now this turns out to be significant because the area of Russia where Zana was from, Georgia, Abkhazia, was historically known for its population of, you guessed it, African slaves, the result of a slave trade that operated from the Arab era on into the Ottoman Empire. Geographically, they would be unexpected, but there's plenty of photographic evidence for black African residents of Abkhazia. Now, it's quite conceivable, therefore, that Zana was a black African slave woman and nothing more. DNA research aligns quite well with the possibility that Zana was no more than an African slave in an unexpected part of the world. In 2015, Professor Brian Sykes, formerly of Oxford University and known for his interest in DNA verification for Bigfoot, published a controversial claim in his book, The Nature of the Beast. Sykes had saliva samples from Zana's descendants tested, along with one tooth from her son, Kvit for DNA analysis. Sykes was clear in letting the public know that Zana was completely human. She was 100% sub-Saharan African. That wasn't the controversial part of his book though. Bizarrely, Sykes said that the genetic results suggested that Neanderthals had survived and migrated into the Caucasus region. He therefore, sort of, claimed that Zana was part Neanderthal, not part Bigfoot. Sykes's conclusion in this regard was not only unprovable, and therefore an overreach of the data, but it also left him vulnerable to clear charges that he considered sub-Saharan Africans as less than truly human, less than Homo sapiens. Needless to say, this is simply incoherent, but at least there is closure on whether Zana was part Bigfoot. Her DNA says she was completely human. It's completely off the table, therefore, to take evidence such as an anecdotal legend and argue that it's proof that Zana was a Bigfoot hybrid. Thanks for watching Fringe Pop 321. Please visit our website for more information about this topic and about all of the episodes of Fringe Pop 321. And the address for that would be fringepop321.com. To support what we're doing here, go to fp321.com slash S, as in the letter S. And please come back and watch other episodes because what you know may not be so.